Well, things are changing these days fairly rapidly as our province starts to think through what it means to open up. And I'm, I'm wondering whether that is arousing a variety of motion, emotions in people, right? As the daily infection numbers go up, anxiety goes up. If the daily infection numbers go down, people get excited about the freedom to be out and about again. Um, as we think about how job uh, places opening up again affects our employment, people begin to feel different things about being back to work. Frontline workers get nervous about greater movement in the culture. People who've been at home get excited about maybe getting to go back to work. It's, it's an interesting mix of emotion around all the changes that are going on every day. But I think one of the most interesting facets of this pandemic has the way, is the way that the pandemic has messed with our emotions when it comes specifically to our work. You just think in the last two months, the pandemic has completely re-scripted the way that we think about work. In fact, divided our entire society into two different categories. You are either essential and our society needs you. And regardless of the danger it poses to you or your loved ones or the public in general, you have to keep doing what you're doing or you're non-essential. Whatever it is that you offer to the world, we just don't need it right now and we don't need you right now is the way that things feel. And it's a hard, I think for both of those groups, it's hard to process emotionally what it means to be essential or non-essential because our culture seeks to define our identity based on what we do, right? It's the very first thing we ask a stranger when we meet somebody. It's nice to meet you. What do you do? How are you a productive member of the producing and consuming cycle of economy that is our society? What is your role? We just weave our identity together with what it is that we produce. And so for essential workers to be told that they're essential, there is this sense that their identity is even more strongly woven with what they do for work, that society's well-being rests in a heavy way on their shoulders. And there's either a source of pride in that or a source of burden to that. For those who are non-essential, there is, I think, for some, a sense of sadness or even lostness, a sense of guilt that they're not doing anything. They're the part of their identity that is tied up with what they do has been lost. Who am I if I can't work? On the one hand, for those who are essential, there are identity issues tied up in the fact that you can't stop because we need you. And on the other hand, there are identity issues with those who are non-essential tied up in the fact that you've had to stop because we don't need you. In both cases, the idea of stopping work has a way of messing with our sense of who we are, of stripping us of some of our identity. Which is surprising that that is true for those of us who claim to be followers of Jesus Christ, because what is interesting is that foundational to the biblical story is the notion of the holiness of stopping work. I'm going to read to you from Genesis chapter 2, starting in verse 1. This is right after the creation myth of Genesis chapter 1, the very first chapter in the Bible that describes in a poetic form the origin of the universe and talks about how God is behind it all. And right after the creation story, this is what it says. Thus, the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work God had been doing. And so on the seventh day, God rested from all God's work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it, God rested from all of the work of creating that God had done. There is a sense that fundamental to who God is, 
is this idea of rest, right? Pick, picture the min, moment in heaven that is being metaphorically described in this passage. The world has been created. The essentials of creation are finished. Is it perfect? No. Is everything completed? No. Is there still work to be done? Yes. And yet God looks at the world and the core act of creating is finished, and God decides that though there is more work to do, the world does not need anybody, including God, God's self, to work to make it better on that day. God, though there was work to do, put down God's tools and rested. And it says that that day was holy. It's the first time the word holy emerges in the entire Bible. It's not to describe God's character. It's not to describe uh, a person's behavior. It's not to describe a holy place. It is to describe the time when God stopped working. That was holy. And I want you to hear this, whether you are an essential worker or a non-essential worker, or you were a stay-at-home parent who we treated as non-essential and then we discovered was completely essential. I want you to hear me say this. If you want to be like God, if you want to be holy, you must periodically put down your tools and rest from your work, because that's what God does. That is God-like. That is holy. On the day, Genesis 2 says, God did three things. He rested. Rest has both a passive and an active component. Passively, God stopped exerting God's self in the labor and the toil of producing more. He said, God said, enough for today. The proactive side is God entered into the happiness, the tranquility on a month when Jerry Stiller has died, the serenity, the peace and the joy of rest. But God did more than rest. It says he blessed the day. The word blessed means to endow something with special power. God in resting endowed the day of rest with a special power that all the other days do not have. It has the power to refresh and rejuvenate, but also to reorient and refocus our heart and our soul and our mind and our lives. It has the ability to help us rediscover the part of our identity that has nothing to do with what we do. It helps us rediscover that we have dignity and value and worth just because we're a human being, not because we have produced something of value for our economy. He rested, he blessed the day. He says he sanctified it. He made it holy. The word holy means he just set it apart from all the other days in order to serve God's purpose and be put to God's use. That's what holy is. Holy is the kind of, it is of the kind of character that it can be distinguished from the rest and used for God's purposes, which means this, the day of rest, resting, is something that is used for God's purposes in a way that work can never be. And so long as we always only ever work, we will never allow God to do the thing that God can only do uniquely when we rest. This is the thing. We live in a culture where our dignity and our worth is rooted in what we do, in what we produce, the value we create for our economy, and the opportunity we provide for other people to consume it. That's our identity as Western people. But our identity as Christian people is that we are loved simply because we are human beings and we don't need to do or produce anything to be uniquely loved and blessed and formed by God. 
This moment is inviting us to rediscover the true identity that we have as human beings rather than human doings. And in order to discover that, God invites us into the spiritual practice of the Sabbath. It first emerges in Exodus chapter 20. This is the fourth of the Ten Commandments, and it says this, Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. God made it holy. We have to keep it holy. How? By doing what God did and stopping. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to Yahweh your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. And if you go on to read, it says, because the Lord your God created the world in six days and then stopped, and you are to be like God, so do your work for six days. There is dignity and worth and value in work. Do it for six days and then discover the dignity of stopping and of being a human being. Remember, God is giving this command to the ancient Israelite people who had been rescued from slavery in Egypt where their work was literally seven days a week and their entire identity was rooted in what they produce. And God says, you're not going to be those people anymore. One day a week, you're going to step out of the cycle of exertion and toil and labor and producing in order to just be someone that I love. In fact, in another place, God says, and if you won't do that, if you won't step out of the work, produce identity in what I do cycle, you can't be a part of my people. It's a part of our relationship that you do this. The rabbis, to describe what a Sabbath day is, would say that it is the experience of heaven on earth one day in seven. That in Genesis chapter 3, after God rests and, and declares the day of rest holy, you discover that because sin is in the world, one of the ways that the brokenness of our world manifests itself is that work is never ending. It is backbreaking, ceaseless labor to try and wrestle productivity out of this world that often seems like it's working against us. That's a part of the brokenness of the world. And so in calling us out of work and into rest, God is saying, step out of the brokenness and curse of the world and step into the blessing of eternity, a place of rest. But it's not just work. The rabbis would say um, that if you think about heaven, if, if it's a day of heaven on earth, then only things that can be experienced in heaven should be experienced on the Sabbath. So it's a vacation not just from your work, it's a vacation from your pain. The rabbis would say no grieving, no mourning on the Sabbath. Because there will be no tears in heaven. It's actually a vacation from your sin. The rabbis would say no repenting on the Sabbath. There's no sin in heaven, nothing to repent of. So on the Sabbath, we celebrate the very goodness of the way that God has created us as human beings. It's a day of rest from the fatigue, from living in a world that moves too fast and too continually. New York City, the city that never sleeps, that is a condition of brokenness in the world. It is a day of rest from the information overload that we experience from consuming so much media and social media and uh, entertainment media and on and on and on. It is a day when we withdraw from producing and consuming and simply experience the delight and the rest of what it means to live the life of heaven on earth one day a week. We only include the things that we will experience in heaven. That is to say, what the Sabbath isn't is what we've often created it to be, which is a whole tangle of rules of what you can and can't do on the Sabbath day, by which we judge and measure each other's spirituality and condemn and criticize people who don't observe the Sabbath like us. Even by Jesus' day, thousands of years after the Ten Commandments, there were Jewish religious leaders who were mad at Jesus because of the rules that he broke when he observed the Sabbath. He would heal people on the Sabbath. He would walk with his disciples through a field of grain and they would pick kernels and eat them like sunflower seeds and and the 
the religious leaders would list off the rules that they were breaking by doing these behaviors. And Jesus' response was this in Mark chapter 2. Then Jesus said to them, the Sabbath was made for people, not people for the Sabbath. God didn't institute the Sabbath so that people would have a whole bunch of extra rules that they had to live by in order to be in spiritual enough to impress God. That's not what spiritual practices are about. Jesus said instead, the Sabbath is a gift that God has given so that we can experience rest and find our perspective, our heart and our mind and our soul and our life refocused and reoriented on the dignity of who we are as human beings so that God can do what God wants to do in our lives that he, that God cannot do on the days when we work. So it's not something for a bunch of rules by which we judge each other. In fact, the Apostle Paul in Romans 14 says, one person considers one day more sacred than the other. Another considers every day alike. Each of them should be fully convinced in their own mind. The Apostle Paul says, you decide how you are going to handle your Sabbath day and nobody can judge you for the choices you make, not even you, provided we're living by Sabbath values. So what does it mean to practice the Sabbath one day a week? It means three things. Same three things it meant for God. Number one, it means choosing rest. To withdraw from this endless cycle of producing and consuming that is our culture. We don't think about work. We don't talk about work. We don't plan our work. We do nothing with regards to work on the Sabbath. Um, but that doesn't mean we free up a day to run errands and do chores and get projects done at home and get the yard work finished. No, whatever is labor or toil or a burden to you, you don't do it on the Sabbath. There are six days to get the grunt work done. The Sabbath is a day for rest. But not just, we don't just choose rest, we choose renewal. Um, it is not simply not doing. It is the celebrating of God's very good creation. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, this is the verse just before God takes his day off. And it says, God saw all that God had made, and it was very good. And the very next thing God does is God rests. You see the logic? The very goodness of God's creation leads God to say, there's no more that needs to be done today. I'm going to rest and revel in the goodness of what is. It is a day to celebrate the goodness of God's world. A day to eat your favorite foods. A day to drink your favorite drink. A day to wear your favorite clothes. A day to do your favorite activities. The things that bring you joy. So here's the thing. If gardening fills you with life and gives you joy and allows you to celebrate the goodness of God's creation, then garden. If gardening is yard work and it's backbreaking labor and you hate it, don't do it on the Sabbath. You have to find your way to experience renewal. There's probably a difference between spending a Sabbath day playing video games or binging on Netflix versus spending a Sabbath day exposing yourself to God's good creation in a walk or a bike ride or a hike, um, sitting on the porch and uh, spending time in community and relationships with the people that God has put in your life that you love. It's about celebrating the very goodness of God's creation. Now, if you're so tired and the rest you need is just flopping on the couch and watching Netflix, that can be a Sabbath too. You have to decide how you will experience rest, how your soul will experience renewal. And thirdly, we choose rest, we choose renewal, we choose reverence. We choose to worship. In Isaiah chapter 66, it says, From one Sabbath to another, all mankind will come and bow down before me, says Yahweh. It is, the Sabbath is not a me day. 
It's not a spa day. It's not even a family day. It's not a day where I rest so that I can be more productive the next day. It's not a day where I reject capitalism uh, and its injustices, though all of those things are tied into Sabbathing at its very core. It is a God day. It is a day where our hearts, our minds, our souls, and our lives are reoriented to our relationship with God. If your Sabbath is a Sunday, worship with your community, and then whatever else fills your Sabbath, do it all with a Godward orientation in your heart. Do it all out of gratitude to God who gives every good thing as a good and perfect gift for us to celebrate and enjoy. Do it all as a prayer. Do it all as an act of worship. Do it all to remember that at your core, you are not what you do. Your dignity comes from the fact that you are. And God loves you just because he does. It's interesting. If you do the math and take one day off every seven, that is on an average lifespan, 11 years of your life, where you get to, instead of working, experience the life of heaven on earth one day a week at a time. But interestingly, there was a scientific study done of communities that very strictly observed the Sabbath, and what they discovered is that people in those communities, on average, live 12 years longer than the average lifespan. For those who commit to the rest and the renewal And the reverence of the Sabbath, not only do you get 11 years of heaven on earth in your life, you get 12 extra years of potential heaven on earth added to your life because the Sabbath is the day of life. When we remember why we're alive why we've been given life in the first place, not because of what we can do, but to experience the dignity of being loved just for who we are. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, stopping is not something that we are good at. Stopping work, exposing ourselves to the criticism of others, of being lazy, feeling lazy and judging ourselves. God, these are not choices that we make easily. And yet you have given Sabbathing a heavenly power to refresh and renew and rejuvenate and reorient ourselves, our souls and our hearts and our minds and our lives to remember why we are alive and who has given us this gift of life and just to receive the love of being loved by you. Would you teach us, God, to stop and to stop well, to be holy in our stopping. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.